this is for parents. If your kid's struggling with motor issues, your kid's struggling with learning issues, attention issues, um, behavioral dysregulation, we want to talk about a little area of the brain called the cerebellum. The cerebellum is uh, really, really important. I'm just going to give a really basic anatomy here. It sits in the back of the head. It's really a small area of the brain, like size of the walnut, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, but it has it houses like 80% of the neurons in the brain. And it's really important for coordinating every aspect of the brain, especially our movement, coordinates our speech, coordinates our eye tracking. So it's really important, especially if it comes to like learning and stuff. If we can't track our eyes, we just, we can't learn. It's, it's as simple as that. If you can't follow a line to read it, you, you can't read, um, <laughs> which is really basic and very often overlooked, to be honest. But uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Kind of the key players that you guys can make some adaptations to in your lifestyle to help this. So we're just going to kind of cover that, but, um, give me a rundown. Cause I, Lauren, the, uh, you know, I, when we first met, you know, your, your kids were still, you know, eating gluten and they had some, some eye tracking issues, some primitive reflexes present, but just tell us your story about how, you know, we, you really went about rehabbing this area of the brain on your own kids in just a real general way and kind of what you saw with, as that changed. For sure. So crunchy chiropractor, really health minded. Like yep. we always fe fed our kids like organic foods, like really healthy diet. Like if we ate gluten, it was sprouted grain. It was organic sourdoughs. It was all like the, like the top of the line foods, yep. if you will. But, um, that food protein within gluten looks like our cerebellum. So we can, if we're, if we have sensitivities to that, that can cause stress in our cerebellum. And when you check my kids, when I first started here, we had some reflexes and I was I was adjusting them. We were active, eating yeah. really healthy. How the heck did that happen? Yeah, right? no kidding. So Carter couldn't VOR, so he'd move his head and his eyes would just go all, all over the place. Yeah. Um, meaning a VOR is also another word for a vestibulo-ocular reflex, which is a big word, simply meaning when their head moves, their eyes can't stay focused or stable. Yep, and so um, we had a Babinski reflex, which you checked, an ATNR and STNR, and like the, that that triad or that that group of reflexes together is an indicator of hey like there's some cerebellar stress here like there's yep. something going on with the cerebellum and so you said take out gluten i, I started bringing a laser home um, started lasering their cerebellum didn't eat gluten did nothing else I, I would just laser their cerebellum when we were watching tv or telling yeah. bedtime stories or singing songs or prayers at night just making it really easy on myself yeah and all of a sudden i was checking that same vestibular ocular reflex and all of a sudden his eyes were moving or with you know, the way they should yeah, yeah. And when we first started, he was having a tough time with that. And then when I was checking him, I'm like, hey, look at my nose, buddy. He goes, I am, dad. Like, he yeah. just like right there, it clicked for him. And then I would see him like like doing it on his own, <laughs> kind of like messing around with started it. Starting to use like, his yeah, body. He's starting like to develop. use it. Yeah. And then from a you know behavior standpoint, behavior improved. Like, yeah. he started regulating. And, you know, he was always a really active, strong kid. But then, you know, his his motor development continued to really take off or really took off at that point yeah. and just a lot more confidence with things at the park and a lot more explorative like yeah. monkey bars and yep. climbing things and balance improvements and um, we started noticing improvements in coloring and handwriting where you know that you know, that stuff happens as we age but it was really it was really noticeably really improved yeah, yeah yeah it was it was sped up for sure yep. And we notice this even with kids that have, um, you know, they're in the office that have big motor coordination issues, or maybe they're not walking and they're like three years old. Yep. And, you know, we work on those areas of the brain and all of a sudden they're now walking five steps and then 10 steps in a matter of a couple of days yep, that, just by activating that area. Like you had mentioned, cerebellum is just motor movement, movement based. And, and yep. it tells the brain what the body's doing. It tells the body what the brain's doing. This is, this is a really great checkpoint in, in that process. And it's necessary for development. And yeah. Uh, so when, when you remove stress to that area, you promote energy production, like through, through laser, you laser yep. the cerebellum, you calm inflammation, you drive that stress down, you laser, you promote energy production, you improve the capability of that part of the brain. And all yep. of a sudden things start clicking. Like yep. it just, it just happens faster. And we see that in, you know, one to four week intensives where you're doing some cerebellar based therapy, but really getting a laser on a cerebellum and 100%. getting the kid's core stronger. Those those are massive, massive um, developmental drivers. Yeah. Sure. And the way I first learned this, and this will help you guys, the parents out there, is the middle of that is the midline aspect of our cerebellum. It coordinates our core stabilizing muscles, kind of everything in the midline of our body. And we see this developing in an infant as they're laying on their belly and they're lifting their head and they're starting to roll and starting to activate their core a whole bunch. And then the 
intermediate areas, those are more for our shoulders and our hips. So we start see those starting to develop when a kid gets up on all fours and starts actually cross crawling. Then the lateral aspects, these um, start to develop as we start to walk, use our feet, start using our hands a lot more and actually start to speak. So you can actually see this develop through those early motor milestones. And that's why those motor milestones and speech milestones are so important is because literally that's just telling us how that cerebellum is developing. So if a kid was off on a lot of those, like, you know, maybe they weren't army crawling, you know, between four and six months, maybe they weren't cross crawling between six and eight months, and maybe they weren't walking right at their tw their first birthday, um, or they're walking really early because they didn't crawl appropriately, or they, you know, brought a leg around, or those motor milestones were all just off. Um, that tells us that cerebellum isn't developing well. And then what we start seeing later is we start seeing some of these behavioral dysregulations. We start seeing a lot of these learning based issues and, and attentional issues and you know, all those things. Yeah. So, so, so touch on a big, a couple of big red flags there, but yeah. head and neck mobility, head and neck control. Step one. I mean, you can see that in an infant as soon yeah. as they come out, 100%. if their head stuck one way, get it addressed, find someone that knows what they're talking about yep. so they can intervene or teach you how you can intervene at home. So that's, yeah. that is definitely, um, first step. So, yep. and that, and that can be the day they're born uh, right. it's as simple as that you know, find a good chiropractor, find yep. a good PT, find a good OT. Like per Perfect example. This is my own son. When he was born, he had a pretty, a, a long birth. He couldn't turn his head to the right. He couldn't tilt his head to the right at all. And luckily I knew what I knew at that point, you know, at the normal range of motion for an infant is their head should actually be able to go actually slightly past their shoulder, which is wild. But most parents are too afraid to even touch their kid and move their head and through all and make sure all this range of motion is there, but you really need to. It's it's normal range of motion to go really their chin can go past their shoulder at birth, which is wild. It's like 110 degrees. Um, the, uh, oh, wait, no, is that right? What's this? Is this 90 degrees? Yeah, it's 110. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, 110. That. Well, and, uh, same with me. I don't know where my second one got his huge head, but he's got a big head and he had a long birth. Like he was in the canal a long time and my wife is strong. And so yeah. there were some strong contractions and he had a big head and he was wedged in there for quite a while. He came out. And he didn't want to turn past midline this yeah. way. So I, like right away, I was able to start working on just promoting the proper range of motion, proper right. mobility in his neck. And um, if I wasn't able to do that, we'd probably have eye tracking issues. We'd probably have yeah, balance issues. Yeah, balance issues. issues. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. Yep. Yep. This video is sponsored by Unraveling the Brain, which is actually my course to train doctors to help these kids in the way that we do. So if you guys know anyone and know any doctors that uh, are in your area that you know are maybe interested in working with kids, go ahead and send them a link to limitlessfoundation.co so that way I can help train them so you guys have a provider close to you guys. Let's jump to the show. Let's talk a little bit about gluten because we mentioned it and we should talk about it uh, kind of to a higher level because this is a really big deal and there's a lot of cross-reactivity with proteins in there. And, you know, it's not as simple as a lot of people go like, oh, gluten isn't a big deal. It's just not what it was, you know, years ago and blah, blah, blah. Um, to be honest, the research is not, it isn't consistent with that. We do know now that a lot of these proteins can cross react with Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. And that's a big word, I know. But the, um, let's talk about those. We'll break it down as simple as we possibly can here for you guys, because it is an important topic. So you mentioned Purkinje and Purkinje's are there to dampen incoming sensory information. Yeah. So kids that have a lot, this is an important point. A lot of kids have a lot of sensory issues. They actually have dysfunction in their cerebellum. So they can't calm down sense like light sound touch is just too abrasive for yeah. them. So when you, kids that have sensory issues go into you know, big social events, or they really get stressed out when there's loud noises, yep. or um, going to the store is just a huge deal, like they just can't handle it. Um, or, you know, things that don't seem like they should be triggers are triggers. Yep. It tells you, hey, that, that cerebellum, those Purkinje fibers aren't calming that sensory information. Yep. And so it just, it floods the brainstem, it puts them in a fight or flight response, even if it's not like a huge response, even like, like a chronic low level fight or flight response really wears on them. Yeah, and it really chronic stresses. anxiety. Yep. Yep. And so a lot of anxiety is coming from cerebellar health or yeah. a lack of yeah. proper cerebellar health. Yep. And just taking a kid through that proper progression and working them through that to strengthen the cerebellum is huge, but also removing stressors to that. Stressors yep. would be food proteins. And um, the way I explain it is we have antibodies within our immune system and those antibodies essentially have barcode scanners. So imagine you're checking out your groceries, but deep, deep, you know, the, the scanners are that tells the computer system exactly what you're buying. Well, antibodies have barcode scanners, if you will, and they're looking for 
protein structures, how how amino acids are stacked up that make different proteins. And when you talk about cross-reactivity or a word called molecular mimicry, yep. food proteins, sometimes the barcode looks like the barcode of our own nervous system. In right. this case, gluten looks a lot like the barcode of our cerebellum. And yep. so kids with gluten issues or chronic digestive issues a lot of times have cerebellar stress. They're, yeah, this 100%. super important part of their brain is not functioning at a, at a high level because you're creating inflammation. Inflammation is a really big buzzword and it's very general, but inflammation just bogs down the nervous system. And yep. when you're bogging down a, an important part of the brain for motor development, for speech, for regulation, you're gonna see symptoms in one or all of those yeah. um, areas of, of development. And this is why, like if you've been struggling to get rid of primitive reflexes for years, I can't tell you how many kids, I mean, hundreds of kids where they've been struggling to get rid of them for years. We take gluten out. Two weeks later, I check them and their primitive reflexes are 90% better or completely gone. I mean, it's super consistent, especially if you start seeing a few of those things like a Babinski reflex and ATNR. They can't, they can't keep their eyes stable. Those are really kind of some big indicators. And, you know, and there's a lot of research on that cross reactivity. It's not, it's not something new. It's been around for years. It's just that if you never heard about it or you're maybe your, you know, your other providers never talked about it, it's just because they're not reading, reading the literature on it, to be honest. Um, and, and it's a really big piece, but a couple other things would be, you know, making sure that parents, you know, when they're pregnant, making sure that, that their thyroid is healthy. Thyroid antibodies can cross react with that. And it's not as simple as just checking your TSH levels. Like that's, it, it, it's really not that simple. You need to have an anti -T, uh, TPO ran, you need to have an antithyroglobulin ran because those can cross react with, with the baby's cerebellum, not your own well, and your own, but really the infant cerebellum. And that's why Hashimoto's, which is a thyroid issue, is really highly related to developmental issues um, in, in their offspring. So making sure that's checked before you're getting pregnant um, or, you know, or if you are pregnant, make sure that gets checked. It's crazy important for the, for the health of the infant. We have a lot of parents that come in and they're like, hey, like, how did this all start? Like these yeah. miss motor milestones. And I'm like, well, how's your thyroid? Oh, I have autoimmunity against my own thyroid. Yeah. I, not to blame or point blame, but that, right. that could, that's a major piece of that puzzle. Yeah. Um, almost all thyroid dysfunction is autoimmune underlying. Yeah. So, um, and then if you take on top of that, like I remember when I was back in school and reading some research on, uh, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, so don't quote me on this, but the uh, it was something like 300 and some uh, neurotoxins and carcinogens are found in the average placenta of a mother, like in the United States, which is unreal to think about that stress. So you have now you have an autoimmune issue against the infant's brain, and then you have all this toxic stress on top of it. Um, it is just really kind of wild to think about. Both of those are really bogging down the health of the cerebellum. And so yeah. when, when kids will come in and sometimes you'll laser cerebellum for a couple minutes, and all of a sudden check their reflexes and so then they're integrated or they're yeah. inhibited. Yeah. Um, just just unlocking that key or um, yeah. just un unlocking that function of the cerebellum yeah. through calming inflammation directly and driving right. that production of energy up. Things click for kids. Yeah. You know? I mean, it, just even yesterday, I had a patient that the uh, came in and was just really inflamed. Brain was inflamed and it was in a uh, pans pandas flare and the uh, you know was screaming profanities, trying to hit, just in a really extremely exaggerated behavioral response and within you know doing 30 minutes of lasering was completely back to normal and especially lasering the cerebellum lasering the frontal lobes trying to hit the basal ganglia um and calming down that inflammation really quick allows them to start regulating yeah. and you know and, and a big piece of their home care is going to be getting these food sensitivities out of their diet um being on supplements to regulate uh inflammation changing their diet to an anti-inflammatory diet. So that way, long-term, the brain can actually start to heal. Because if it's inflamed, it can't heal, it can't activate, and it can't function. There, there's a lot of people that have done those things, but when you throw photobiomodulation over that, uh -huh. using a laser on the cerebellum. Yep. And rehabbing the cerebellum mm -hmm. and activating it, it's it, a game changer. It, it really is, it really is. And so, like when we take a kid that's not walking, or a kid that has these big motor delays, or they're not hitting their motor milestones, and you activate their cerebellum, you you allow it to do what it needs to do. And all of a sudden they start taking more steps. 
um, that's a that's something that not many providers address. Now, right. you know, you, you might go to speech or OT and they're working on these things, but if you're not driving function in that important area of the brain, you're you're missing a major piece of the puzzle. You're yep. ma- you're missing your way in a lot yep. of times, and so sure. that's something that you know you've developed here and just being able to assess where a kid is, identify areas of the brain that aren't as strong as they could be, promoting health, promoting development there, and all of a sudden these motor milestones really start in, unfolding quickly. Yep. They start regulating better. They start having you know, better attentional networks. They, their work capacity increases. They're not fatiguing. They're not melting yep. down. Yep. Um, it, it's it's such a such a big deal. Yeah, let's give, um, just before we go here, um, so we talked about removing food sensitivities, and especially gluten with this area of the brain, but let's talk about just really quick here you know, a lot of people, you may not know, but Lauren was a, a strength and conditioning coach at, at a collegiate level before he went to chiropractic school and stuff. But so this is a perfect topic for you. What's three just exercises or activities a young kid could do to develop their cerebellum? Sure. Um, just core stability, planking, just simple things. And, and when we provide our home plans to parents, I'm always, I'm always saying the more people involved in this, the better. So get on the floor with your kids, yep. like make it, make it fun. And like, we, we've even got some videos where we'll, or, or some demonstrations of exercises where we'll do rock, paper, scissors while we're holding a plank. And so we're making it engaging, we're making time go a lot faster, or we play a card game while holding a side plank and just make it make it tolerable for, yeah. for your kid. Because these things are hard, especially kids with cerebellar health issues, it's hard to stabilize your spine. And so yeah. when you're working on something that's weak, something that's inefficient, make it fun. Yep. Um, get them up on some sort of balance challenge, like yep. a balance beam or a, a BOSU ball or some sort of unstable surface. Yeah. And we like it, using Bobo board a lot. Oh Big yeah. Big shout out for the Bobo yeah, board. Yeah, Bobo Man, board's that great. Awesome. It is great. So they're they're focusing their eyes. They're having to stabilize. It's it's an excellent it's way. It's a video game. They, yeah. They're just enjoying it. Or if, if, if you don't have that, throw them up on a, a, a BOSU ball while they're gaming. You know, if, yeah. they, if they're playing some, you know, age appropriate game, and they're working on their balance at the same time, or you know, in order to play the game, maybe ten minutes of this activity first before they get that game, or yeah. before they get to watch that show, or if they're watching a show, make them balance b- before. Yep. Um, and then from there, just man, get them active, get them, get them to the, yeah. take them to the parks, um, e- explore new things, teach them new skills, play. Play new sports. Yep. You know, Neurons that fire together, wire together. So the yeah. more complex that movement, the more complex development the cerebellum gets, and then the more complex development the brain gets. And it, for sure. And so you have either they're getting out, they're developing, they're working on things, or they're sitting in one spot. Like it's yeah. really the way it is. They're, so. they're either actively connecting new neurons or they're actively <laughs> degenerating neurons. Seriously, seriously. So, and then from like a parent standpoint, like one of the best things I do for my health is I go to the park with my kids. I chase yeah. them around. I'm, I'm hanging on monkey bars. Like I'm keeping my brain yeah. healthy and trying to keep my my body as healthy as possible. So yeah. how many, uh, how many adults can't balance on something anymore or can't, you know, do these complex things and that's degenerating their brain too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So core stability, get them on an unstable service and get them active. Yeah, play get, like a kid. Yep. Yep. For sure. For sure. That's huge. Awesome. Yep. Well, thanks for your time, Jay. Appreciate it. Thanks for sharing. Parents, hope you love this. Um, Subscribe, tune in. Uh, We're going to keep sharing stuff like this to help not only you, but your kids as well, especially your kids, sharing lots of good content to to help you guys out in a long form way here. So enjoy your day. If you like the show, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. Love to have you follow us. Love to have you help learn how to help kids if you're a doctor or a parent that's you know maybe struggling a little bit of different things you can do to you know help your own kids so see you next time